afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us um, from wherever you're coming from. Uh, we're so happy to have you here at this exciting panel discussion for Pixar's Out as part of Frameline 44. If you haven't yet seen Out, um, you need to remedy that right away, but the film will be available for free um, on frameline.org until the end of tomorrow, so you have plenty of time to catch up. Um, and as we're talking, if you come up with any questions, um, audience questions can be submitted in the comments, either through CineSend, Facebook, or YouTube, wherever you're watching. Um, and we have a very lively group here, so I'm gonna get right into the introductions. Um, they're gonna introduce themselves, beginning with uh, Steve, the director. Hi, I'm uh, Steve Hunter. I'm the director of Out, sitting here at the lovely Pixar campus in Emeryville, California. Max. I am, yeah, I'm Max Acker. I was a producer on Out. And I'm also streaming live from Pixar, just a few feet away from my buddy, Steven. And uh, super excited to be here, part of Frameline. We wish we could be there with you all in person at a, at a theater, but uh, this is the next best thing. And, and we hope you all enjoyed the film. Uh, Noah? Hi, I'm Noah Newman. I'm the editor of Out, also here at Pixar uh, with Max and Steve. And we're, yeah, I'm very excited to be here. Thanks for having us. And I'm Jake Monaco. I'm the composer for Out, and I am down in Los Angeles. Um, very happy to be here and just be part of this incredibly special project. Kareha? Hi, I'm Kareha Yoko. I um, was the Anim Sufan Out, and I am sitting in my front yard. <laughs> Sorry, I can't Where? join you guys, Pixar. Where? <laughs> in, uh, in Sonoma, <laughs> California. Yeah. Hi everybody, my name is Matthew Martin and I play Gigi the cat and I am in my apartment in San Francisco, California, my hometown. Yay. So fabulous. Yeah, so Steve mm -hmm. and Max and Noah are all actually at the Pixar campus. Very exciting. Um, but Steve, let's just start with you. Um, can you just share how, you know, the seed of this idea and the inspiration for the film? Sure. Um, I, uh, I was lucky enough to work on the first two Spark Shorts on um, with um, Kristen Lester and, and, and Brian Larson, uh, Smash and Grab and, and uh, Pearl. And it was, a, it was a really great experience. And then they were asking if I had any ideas for, uh, for a film and I, I had to run home and <clears throat> come up with something. And uh, I started writing down themes of stories that I wanted to tell and I just kept coming back to like um, a coming out story. I just kept writing that down. Like I couldn't come up with anything else. I just something I needed to explore, uh, you know, and in, in a funny way. And so, it, but I think a lot of it was because I just wanted to create something for my like my younger gay self who never saw anything uh, like himself in film. And I just wanted to put something out there in the world so that you know kids like me could have could see themselves. And you mentioned the Spark Shorts program. Um, does someone just want to quickly explain what that is and? For our listeners, uh, yeah, I could talk a little bit about it. Um, I don't know if you're picking up an echo. Maybe Steve, you might have to put yourself on mute because I'm oh three sorry. feet away from you. It's okay. <laughs> um, the Spark Shorts program, Spark Shorts program was introduced in 2018 at Pixar. Um, it's relatively new, but uh, they're all short films, and the goal of it was to find filmmakers and storytellers and producers um, from all parts of the studio, from technical departments, uh, from to store, to animators, um, and and tell stories uh, that maybe they otherwise wouldn't get a chance to tell. Um, and so it's it's a really diverse palette of, of different kinds of experiences through film. Um, but also gives us an opportunity to kind of test new production pipelines, new workflows, new ways of telling stories, uh, films that maybe look a little bit different than folks are used to with normal Pixar films. So. Uh, there's a handful of them that are available um, on YouTube and, and of course on Disney Plus. Yeah, I thought it was interesting you described it as sort of like an indie studio within Pixar. Yeah, it's um, you know you are working under pretty tight constraints in terms of like timeline and budget, but um, I think that's what makes it fun. You have a lot of creative freedom. There's not a lot of creative oversight. You kind of have the freedom to put put the team together as you see fit to support the story. And um, you know, as long as you're 
not making some kind of rated R Pixar flick. It's kind of anything goes. And um, so, so that's, that's kind of the indie vibe that it has is, is you have total autonomy over the kind of story that you want to tell. Um, Matthew, um, sorry, Steve. Sorry, sorry. Um, I'll get the hang of this in a sec. Um, the nice thing about working at a major motion picture studio like this is that you got a lot of toys to play with. So even though we're an independent film, we get to we get to play around with a lot of different little technology and 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 uh, play and really play around. The other thing that's really refreshing about working on the shorts is that they're really small teams. So you're really getting into it with a small group of people. Uh, it's just a different experience than working on you know a feature that's 200 plus people working on it. Yeah, you all. I've just you all seem to have such a great rapport. Um, how did this particular team of everyone we have assembled here come together? Oh boy, geez. Well, Max and I had worked together. Um, we had met on Wally, -E, and then we had worked together on Incredibles Two. So we'd been friends for a long time. Uh, and then you know when it came time to get a producer, it just seemed like a good fit for the two of us. Um, and then, gosh, just every, it just felt like everybody, all, all of you guys just fell right into place, you know? Like, I definitely wanted Kareha to be a part of it, you know? She loves dogs. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember when you you said, I, I think I need to go write something. It was like a weekend or something. And then you, you came back at the end of the weekend with this fully evolved script and you had me read it. I said, dude, it's, it's all here. It's already written. How did you do it so quickly? So you must have, it must have just been Apparently. sitting in your head, just waiting to come out. And I was so excited that you, you um, chose me to work with yeah, you. When you, when you read the tomorrow. script, did you uh, have an idea already of the visual style you wanted to? Oh yeah. I could just see it <laughs> just because it's so Steve. Um, to have magic dogs and cats with rainbows, and um, I was as soon as I as soon as I read that, I was like, oh, I still want to work on this. So how did how did the visual style of the film come about? You all mentioned that the Spark Shorts is a place to sort of be a little more experimental with that. <laughs> Sorry, uh, <laughs> this is weird. This is so weird. Okay, so. Uh, no, I mean a lot. Of, like I said, it was I wanted to write something for like my little seven-year-old kid to to see himself in. So then I it got we got back to like uh, uh, children's books. You know, I went back to like looking at little golden books that I would read as a kid, or like, but especially like uh, Mary Blair, like the the work that she would do for Alice in Wonderland and Cinderella. Um, that sort of gouache, look painted look was just such a poster, like just like looks like a beautiful little painting. Um, and I really like that. I like the simplicity of it. Um, so, and like we said, we a lot of the a lot of the models that we're using are from Toy Story Four, I think. And so, like a lot of them, we just started stripping stuff out. Like, cause, you know, we make these movies, and we have like tons of controls on these characters, and and we're making a small independent move, like a small film. But I had ten minutes of story that I needed to get done in a very small amount of time. So we tried to strip some stuff away. So we took the eyes out and put little pieces of geometry floating over them, and just animated these things sliding around. And that sort of like, so it was an evolution of like coming up with the style based on how the story itself, but then also like the, the independent film quality of like, how do you get this thing done in a very short, quick amount of time? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I want to give a huge shout out also to like the looks development team um, that there was, there were a ton of folks who helped make this film, but in particular our looks development team led by Gordon Cameron, Dave Lally, Colin Thompson, Andrew Pinar. They basically took what Steve had been talking about, how can we create a moving painting, right? Which is hard to do, especially Pixar, where we're so used to seeing such fine granular detail in everything that we do. And, but but the, but they came, I don't know, I wish we could tell you how, tell you how we did it, um, but they're the experts, but, um, you know, we no used, we used no yeah. <laughs> but there's something great about this idea of a painting with the story, right? Because life is kind of imperfect, life has, ambiguity life has imperfect lines and imperfections in it and the idea of kind of using the world of paint and stroke um i thought was like a, a really nice marriage um, between visual and, and story and that goes and plays into the music as well with this kind of raw and 
organic sound. Um, I really like what you just said about how, you know, like the, the granular, the detail of everything and kind of being able to step away from that and just, and being able to see and feel a lot of the raw emotion that is in the film and in what the film does so well. And having the music be able to support that and, you know, being able to have it be a little bit, a little bit rough around the edges, a little, a little raw in that respect, um, I think played into that as well. Mm. Yeah. I, I mean, also, Jake, you, 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 sorry, go ahead. I was, I was also super impressed with the animators, with Correa's team, um, because you have these faces of these characters that just don't have a lot of detail, the detail we're used to in Pixar films. So it's an added challenge to figure out how to bring out the emotion from, you know, they have two dot eyes and very simple mouth geometry. So the animation team did a fantastic job bringing those characters to life. Yeah, I was so proud of our team. And I have to say, I really loved working with this small team because it feels like a family. And it just reminded me of um, kind of the old days when we were in the, the building in Point Richmond. And um, just you could, you could talk to people every day from every department. And um, the collaboration of it was really wonderful. Um, I do miss that. Uh, yeah. Um, Matthew, how did you uh, come to the project? And um, yeah. Well, I'm a, a, a performer here in San Francisco, primarily stage productions. And Steve, um, a, um, a friend of mine, the who you know factor, a friend of mine who worked at Pixar, um, Jim recommended, I think, um, Stephen to get in touch with me about doing the part. So, um, uh, then Steve was nice, gracious enough to come over and sort of show me a rough outline of it. And I just remember turning to him once I saw sort of a rough draft of it. And I said, has Disney or Pixar ever done anything like this before? And he said, no. So um, just the groundbreaking aspect of it. Um, so, but I believe Steve had seen me on stage, I, be I believe, uh, um, as well before. So that's... That's how I got my foot in the door. And I had no idea of going, I'm a native San Franciscan going to Emeryville. And I, I don't know what I had in my head, an office building, the studio, but it was like pulling up to Warner Brothers and it was just mind blowing. It's such a beautiful campus. I, I described it as like UCLA on steroids. And it was just like, everyone was so gracious and um, I had the best time. So um, just so honored to be a part of it. Yeah, Did I tell I, that story had, right, Steve? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had seen you, what I had seen you in was the Golden Girls. Oh, right. In the city. Yeah, oh, quite a few times over the years. And it was like, and then, and then when Jamie uh, Roderick recommended you to yes. do the voice, it was like, uh, the minute he said it, I was like, oh my God, yes. <laughs> like, it was definitely. Like, I, I could hear you doing the voice in my head when, when he said your name. I was just like, oh yeah, this is perfect. You Thank know. you so much. Yeah. How do you... I think when I think when you first came into the recording studio and you know Gigi has very few selective lines but <laughs> each one very very important very very important and I remember like I think when you f first read the line Steve and I just kind of looked at each other we were like <laughs> oh yeah that's so perfect. That's, perfect. that's perfect I was well I was nervous and excited so I was chatty Maddie and I was just going to town what kind of cat do you want? You know, I was just going through. Anyway, yeah, you did you know, like you did like Eartha Kit, right? <laughs> what else, what else? Didn't you do a Dolly Parton one or something? Or I, you you, you named it. I did it. I said, yeah. "Hi, yeah. cat, low cat, you know, Kathleen Turner cat. What kind of?" Cat <laughs> oh, do that's you a like? Kathleen Turner cat. I, I can purr. <laughs> you a lot of purr. I can make a perfect pinafore. And you a lot of purrs end up coming <laughs> from. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it was just anyway. So I'm just uh, you know being a, lo a, a stage performer. You know my audience is limited, and I've made a couple of films, but it just blew my mind to see this thing go boom around the world, and to see you know New York Times reviews, and just so so proud to be a part of it, and I'm so thrilled, especially for you, um, Stephen and and Max, and just uh, thank you for having me be a part of it. So very grateful. Thank you for being a friend. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, how has the response to the film been? And was it anything <clears throat> that any of you all could have anticipated? That I remember the first weekend, Max and I, like, you know, we we're on Twitter and listening to comments come in and stuff like that. And it was really both of us were at the same time. We're like, this is overwhelming. Like, it was really like kind of shocking. And, and what was awesome was the spectrum 
of like comments from folks. Like there was the, there were like the, the guys, the, the gay men my age who were like, I'm 51. And it was like, these guys were like, I wish I'd had this when I was a kid, you know? So like the, the, the totally like validated the reason I wanted to make this thing, right? Just to validate my younger self. And that, that like people felt that. And then the other ones was, was the families with children who were like watching it with their kids. And they had these amazing conversations about what love was. You know, like what love is and why can't you love? Why It's great that Greg loves men well. Why can't he love, you know, like, you know, to them, it, I love that this generation is sort of like, what's the big deal with this movie <laughs> kind of thing, which is a great place for us to be in, you know? We need more of that. Yeah, I mean, we do need more of that. And it's it's interesting to me to watch culture kind of catch up. And it's so wonderful to see Pixar putting, you know, putting support behind a film like this. Um, yeah, and we, we discussed briefly, you know, there's yet to be a, a gay protagonist in, in a Pixar film. Um, it, are, are you optimistic for the future? Something like that coming down the line? I gotta believe it. I mean, this is like a first step, right? Like, I feel like Pixar's always been a director-driven studio. We have storytellers telling their stories. We just haven't had a gay one yet tell his story or her story or their story. You know, like we need those filmmakers and storytellers to start to, to start telling their stories whether it's at Pixar or anywhere else. And I, I do think that the personal aspect of this film, like it captured everybody who was on the show. And uh, there was an energy um, to this crew that I felt um, like it was tangible, you know, and, um, and very emotional too, I have to say. Uh, yeah. yeah, even, it, even it, the people brought, that weren't on it, right? Yeah, no, and I think pe uh, people who were on really wanted to be on. They'd seen it and they could feel, you know, I mean, they could feel that it was coming from the heart, you know. Um, and whether you're, you know, you're straight or gay or from any sort of background, like you, it was, it was, it was universal, that feeling. So, yeah. Everybody wanted to make this totally. the best possible thing that it could, that it could be. I remember like, Steve being like, I love it. It sounds great. I'm literally asking him for more notes or feedback or something. It's like, are you sure? Like, what if we tried this? Like, we wanted to experiment so much just so that we could find and make it the, the best and most special thing that it could possibly be. And I think that's just, that that's so exciting. I think that's why we all just got along so well, just the passion that we all had. Yeah, and, and the production at times was chaotic because we had to make this between other productions and you know, people were getting pulled on and off the show like daily, right? Every couple hours, it's like, oh, we're gonna get so and so. Oh, never mind. We're another show just took them, and so <laughs> you're constantly readjusting most your of, casting, right? Go ahead. Yeah, most of those short films you know, are, are made over the course of like around six months or so. Ours was it took a little bit longer because you know Steve and Korea, you guys had to both hop off and go help one of the features, right? So again, back to that indie filmmaking at a big studio. You're kind of dancing in between the cracks, like trying to trying to trying to make this thing while also trying to help all the other projects that we have going on. So you know, I know I was cutting you know other work while also working on this. You know, Jake, you had other projects going on. Everybody's that's where the passion project element comes out of it, right? Like you, you do anything you can to just kind of to work towards it. Mm -hmm. Um, in just a few minutes, we'll be starting to take questions from the audience. So if you want to get their questions in, just get those in for now. Um, I love that this film opens with based on a true story and then goes straight to like a rainbow and a talking dog and cat. Um, but it was, <laughs> was there any truth? That to actually it? happened. That actually happened, Steve. I mean, come on, tell them about that you know, experience you had. Totally true. They came down and made me into a dog. <laughs> That's it's completely true, everything. Yeah. Totally true, absolutely true. <laughs> but is there any truth to it being based on a true story or? I know yeah, it's a story for you. Yeah, I, th I feel like a lot of it is just, it's based on the true stories of all the, you know, gay men and women that I've known over the years and the stories of coming out stories. And even straight guys that the dads thought they were gay and they tell me stories about what it was like, you know, to come out to their dad as straight. <laughs> Uh, I did, and and so it, to me, it was just more like I was taking the flavor of all those stories and kind of trying to make something that felt true to them all. I wasn't trying to tell just one, like the like the coming out story. I was just trying to create something that everybody could feel true to, you know. And I think one of the things I really love is that the moms, just moms, are like totally respond to this movie. Like 
I can't believe the response I'm getting from from the mothers out there. It just blows me away. Yeah. yeah, it's got a there's an access point I think for people from all walks of life, right? Like people who have this shared experience that you know Steve has had and many others have had. Not every coming story coming out story is a good one, right? There are bad ones out there. But you know, like Steve said, for friends or for parents or for for you know lovers of any kind, just the idea of staying true to who you are, right? I think there's no matter where you come from, if you look at this film, you could probably point to a character on screen and, and kind of tie tie a personal experience to that. Just to be fair, we also thought it was very funny to say based on a true story and then have a rainbow and a pink cat and dog. <laughs> but well, what they said- Steve, is, Steve, isn't that based on the photograph your sister sent? You said it with the dog and the cat too? It's that, yeah, the dog and cat are based on my brother's dog mags and his cat Gigi and Gigi's just an asshole I'll just say that I'm sorry kid <laughs> but um th his dog Megs unfortunately Megs li literally the week before the film came out Megs passed away oh but it was based on but it was based on a little image that he had drawn for our niece and we had done this thing about the dog on a rainbow and he had photoshopped Gigi the cat sitting on the back and I was like I'm using I'm totally stealing that from my brother he can't sue me Screw it. I'm doing it. <laughs> Love it. Um, we've got a question from the audience. How can I buy that lamp? Got a real. <laughs> oh. It's pretty big. Are those lamps like standard issue? Every every office. No, it's like huge. It's Look. Huge. Oh, it's huge. <laughs> it's not... huge. The magic of perspective. I, I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> it lights up at night. It's pretty awesome. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's it. pretty awesome. It lights up and it shines on the ball. It's over there. <laughs> cool. So good. Um, to read. Is, what has been your favorite reaction to the film? Oh, geez. Like, I, it's the kids, hearing the kids. I had some friends over in Belgium that. They sent me the kids' responses. They have three three little kids, and that was one the one I mentioned earlier, where he's like, "It's good." Greg loves Manuel was literally like the three year old's response. <laughs> like it was amazing, you know. Those those are the ones for me. It's like when the kids who are just like, "What's the big deal?" You know. Yeah, they probably don't even realize they're seeing anything unique. Yeah, yeah. When it was such a big deal for us when we were kids back in the eighties, right? It was like right. such a ah. There's no way. I didn't come out till I was 27. So it was a long, it took me a long time to finally do it. And my coming out thing was like, I called my parents from Pixar, from a conference room at Pixar, because I broke, my boyfriend had broken up with me. So I called them from a conference room at Pixar. And I talked to my parents on, you know, on two phones and I was talking to them both and told them. And I might, I was talking to my mom for a little bit. And then I go, mom, where's dad? She goes, oh, he went to get ice cream. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. So then she's like, but uh, you know, I, you're my son. I love you no matter what. Be safe. You know, and we hung up. And then, like, an hour later, my dad called me back and was like, hey, just wanted to let you know I had to just had to go for a walk, but and get some ice cream. But you're my son and I love you no matter what. Kind of thing. And so I had a, I had a really good coming out experience, you know. But I'm so, I was lucky, you know. Well, and I think a lot of people can relate to that feeling of, you know, assuming there's going to be one reaction and then being pleasantly surprised. Right, right, yeah, yeah. That's something you do so well in the film. Well, I think that was just coming down to like, I remember Kristen Lester the first time, the director of Pearl, who really helped me out on the story on this was, she. we sat down and looked at that first pass of boards and she was like sitting there and she was like, I think what you're trying to say is like, we can talk to our dogs more than we can talk to each other. <laughs> And that guy was like, yeah, yes. You know, I just nodded and wrote that down. But it was like, it was that feeling of like, you know, like the way Greg can say, what's wrong with me to this dog? You know, I did that to my dog constantly. Like a lot of my breakups, I was like, hey, you know, and that poor dog was just like, what are you doing? You know, and like, and like the way the way mo the mom in the film like talks to the, is able to talk to the dog more than, and that was in from the very beginning. That first version that Crea read was like always in there. It was just really badly written and really long and terrible, but. It was, it was in there. The core was there for sure. <laughs> the core was there. This was, you know, way more words. I think that's one of the cool things about it too, Steve, is that this 
the out is the mom story just as much as it's Greg's story in a lot of ways. So we spent a lot of time working on um, working on getting the emotional side from her perspective also, because uh, you thought it was important to show that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, we've got another question um, about the response to the film. Ha has it been polarizing at all from, from what you know in maybe in certain countries with stricter laws or, or ideas around queerness? I haven't heard anything of it not being shown anywhere. Max, I don't know if you can speak to that. But yeah, you know, I know that Disney Plus doesn't exist in all territories yet, I don't think, um, but as far as as far as we've heard and, and kind of known and been exposed to, there hasn't been any kind of, um, you know, severe backlash in that in that way, right? And and you know, we try not to pay attention to that kind of stuff anyway. I think there there the love for the film and the support for the film has greatly outweighed anything that might exist out there that's you know, thinks that it's not fit for anything because it is. This is this is a film just like any other family film that is a reflection of the world that we live in, right? This is there's truth in this and it comes from a real place and it's based on real people's experiences. So, um, you know, we, we're just enjoying all the, all the, all the love we're getting for it and being here talking about it, seeing all these, all these folks who worked on it. Um, we've got another question about how did the designers come up with hunting camp? The hunting camp that was, uh, um, uh, Mike Daly, who did the storyboarding with me earlier on, he just started drawing it. He, got, he just started drawing that in one of the storyboards. It wasn't in the original script. He just started sketching Greg with his hat on because he thought it would look like a dog's ears. And he just thought it was funny. And we were just like, of course. And that's how these things get made sometimes. You just, you know, I've heard, I, I, it's really humbling because I've heard those stories of like, if somebody has a good idea, people just kind of come on and they just make it better and better. And I really experienced that making this movie. You know, there's like that. That's one thing. And then another, you know, like with Jake's music coming in, right? Like, like the minute Jake wrote this piece of music for me, that was like, I was like, I'm working on this film and there's this part, I want to have this weird percussion kind of stuff in the second act. It's really crazy. And he goes, oh, here, Hobbs, here's this piece of music I wrote. <laughs> I'm like, what? And I just laid it on, onto the, into my storyboards, you know, in premiere. And I was just like, oh, look, it works. What do you know? <laughs> it's amazing. It's just I felt funny this, how it falls. Yeah. You go. I felt the same about the animation too, Steve, because um, there was a fluidity and uh, and sort of a carefreeness to the way people came up with ideas, and the animators would just come up with their own ideas and throw them in, and they they all just worked so well. And some of them were really crazy. The flying squirrel, <laughs> yeah. When, when the, when Mags and Gigi, yeah. Mags and Gigi, when Mags and Gigi take off at the end, they fly through the rainbow, and they go into that flying squirrel pose. That was not. <laughs> that was just the animator coming up with a crazy idea and sticking it in. You're like, okay, ben, ben let's do it. <laughs> That's so good. Yeah, I mean, Noah, I'd, like, I'd love to hear from you because I know in, um, you know, in live action stuff, people often say the edit is sort of the third iteration of the film, but I imagine it's it's much more f a fluid of a process with animation. Yeah, um, in animation, the editors work. Um, from the very beginning uh, with the director. Uh, the We start with storyboards and uh, sit and cut the individual storyboards together to give an approximation of what it'll look like when it's animated. So really we're working it um, in, that, in that part of the process to make sure that the story's working uh, and the characters and the emotionality is all coming across. Uh, and we do that before we uh, even start thinking about animation. Um, so it's storyboards and then uh, layout, which is where we have um, we have our camera team uh, create actual shots, um, and then we cut that together, and then we move into animation and, and incorporate their magic, which really helped bring the character to life. But it was a great, um, this is a super collaborative show, like everybody's been saying, and uh, we actually, we ended up being pretty close to what we started with in the storyboards by the time we got finished. I mean, the animators added their magic and the lighting and everything, and the look really brought everything together, but yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. We 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 had a great time working on it. And the music, Jake, thank you, um, really drove it. I mean, we talked about that that second act of the of the short where uh, with all the hijinks running through the house and, and the action segment. That was all. A lot of the timing of that was really informed by this that one percussion piece that Steve got from 
Jake, you know, months before we even started working on this. Uh, just like the, the rhythm and the pacing of that really helped us uh, find that action. It was great. The panic. There was so much panic in it, you know, <laughs> in that percussion. <laughs> so good <laughs> it is a it's a rare rare thing to be able to come on to a project so early and be able to something completely apart from picture and just based on conversations or emotions or maybe other pieces we've talked back and forth or like anything like this and so to be able to generate something in in that respect completely apart from from anything cool and then seeing how it how it does help inform certain things. It's, it's, it's a very different approach um, from what I get to do. Um, usually, I'm brought in after things are put together, or you know, we have a first pass of the edit, or there's some temp music in there, music from um, another project that maybe some of the creatives have pulled in, and this is the tone that we're looking for. But there really wasn't too much of that, so we got to start blank slate, which I think was really exciting, at least for me. <laughs> I think for the rest of the team too. And being able to kind of experiment with some percussion and what weird things or weird oddities can we can we put in there? Because there's a lot of fun percussion and it can keep it light and you know and 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 frenetic in a lot of ways. And one of the one of the things that I ended up using were these these kids' toys called <laughs> Boom Whackers. <laughs> called boom whackers. <laughs> so love um, them. Let's hear it. So it's and there's many different ways to play them. I mean, you're hitting them against each other or you know like on different surfaces they all kind of give a different sound and then when you bind certain ones together you get different pitches so you can kind of create this big you know melodic situation um but without using traditional uh orchestral instruments or um traditional sounds in that respect so being able to not only do something with different instruments but then also taking instruments that might be a little bit normal like a drum kit and taking one of the toms and instead of playing a normal tom bending down on the the head of it and and hitting it so it gets boo -doo 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 -doo. and you get this kind of like bendy effect and how you utilize different things in different ways and i think it's that kind of creativity that everybody brought to this project that made it so special in each one of the each of our departments mm. thank you that's that's really fascinating thanks for walking us through that um, one more audience question is someone would love to see a making of extra like the other spark shorts on Disney plus. And do we have any BTS in the can that we can. Oh, it's, they actually put one on, uh, it's on YouTube. Yeah. There's one, there's one that's live. Okay. Yeah. I think they just, they, for whatever reason, they just decided to put it out into the world on YouTube and then it's, it's not, yeah, for some reason it's not on Disney plus yet. I don't believe. Cool. So there is a behind the scenes making up. Cool. Yeah. This person yeah. also wants you to know that they're hoping for some Academy Awards love for you guys. So. <sighs> Don't jinx it. <laughs> I don't know. Pixar, Pixar has a pretty good uh, track record at, at those Oscars. So pretty, you pretty, pretty, pretty good. This might, might be on the fast track. Um, <laughs> is the pink lamp in the film a nod to Luxo Jr.? <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, part of it is, you know, you try and find little ways to, again, tie it all into the Pixar family, right? And so part of it is little Easter egg things like that. Part of it also just the nature of the spark shorts is like, we don't have a lot of time to make this. So what existing models already exist in our like asset backlog? Like get that basketball, get that lamp, get that bed, get that set prop here and there. So. Um, we had a pretty resourceful team, but yeah, that may or may not have been there as an homage. That's so interesting to think about those little homages as like shortcuts sometimes. It's a good little tidbit. Um, thank you all so much. I think we've we've um, come to the end of our time together, sadly, but um, congratulations on the film again. It's so beautiful. Um, so glad you guys were able to make it. And you're such a fun team. I can really tell, I think everyone watching can tell, you know, all the heart and humor that went into out just from hearing you all speak. And thank you everyone for coming uh, to Frameline 44's panel on Pixar's Out. Thank you for having us. Thank yeah. you so thank much. Thank you for watching everybody. Thank you, Frameline.